You can't go through life without experiencing some troubles. Every day we face new trials. Sometimes they are big and sometimes they are small. But either way, we can always count on God to get us through. God is bigger than our troubles, and no matter what we face, we can trust Him to conquer anything and everything, from the simple matter of hunger to the end of life itself. God can do absolutely anything. If you are hungry, God can feed you. Luke 9 tells the story of Jesus preaching to a large crowd when his disciples approached him and told him to send the people away to find food and lodging. Jesus told the disciples to feed the crowd, but they exclaimed that they couldn't. They only had five loaves of bread and two fish, and it would have cost too much to go out and buy enough food for the 5,000 men who were there. But Jesus instructed the disciples to divide the crowd into groups of 50, and Jesus broke the bread and gave thanks to the Lord. Then the disciples distributed the food, and there was more than enough to eat. They collected 12 baskets full of leftovers. The disciples had looked at the few loaves and two fish and decided that the task to feed the people was impossible. But Jesus looked at the food and knew that it would be more than enough because God would provide for his people. We often look at situations like the disciples did from an earthly perspective, but Jesus examined it from a heavenly perspective. He looked for help from above rather than send the people away hungry. This story is about physical hunger, but the Lord also provides his people with the bread of life. If you are fortunate enough to receive three meals a day, physical hunger may not pose a problem for you. But are you being spiritually fulfilled as much as you are being physically filled? In John 6, Jesus says, It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Just as Jesus provided his people with earthly bread, he provides us with heavenly bread as well. We need food to satisfy our physical hunger, and we need Jesus to satisfy our spiritual hunger. Without him, we will starve. But with him, we never have to worry about hunger again. Jesus also satisfies both our physical and spiritual thirsts. When Jesus was in Samaria, he sat down by a well and asked a Samaritan woman for a drink. The woman was surprised that he was speaking to her because Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus told the woman about living water and said, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Naturally, the woman was intrigued by this water that would forever slate her thirst. She said that she believed the Messiah was coming, and Jesus told her, I am he. By delivering salvation to his people, Jesus has provided us with living water that will sustain us throughout eternity. He provides the daily water that keeps us alive on this earth. But he has also provided the living water that will sustain us now and forever. God has gone above and beyond to provide for his people. He has provided more for us than we will ever truly understand. When you place your hope and trust in the Lord, you don't have to worry about the daily troubles of hunger and thirst because you have the bread of life and the living water that will last for eternity. Hunger and thirst are not the only troubles we experience in this life. It is common to deal with sickness as well. Whether you experience illness personally or it affects someone close to you, but God has proven time and again that he triumphs over sickness. In Matthew 8, Jesus was approached by a man with leprosy who knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched the man, and he was immediately healed. A few verses later, he was approached by a centurion who explained that his servant was lying in bed paralyzed. Jesus asked if he should come to heal him, but the man replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. Jesus was amazed at the man's faith and the servant was healed at that moment. 
Jesus then healed Peter's mother-in-law from her fever and cast out demons from those who were possessed. We tend to fear sickness because, despite modern medicine, we can't always be cured. In the Old Testament days, someone with leprosy or paralysis had no hope of being healed by the medical professionals of the time. But they weren't completely without hope because they believed in Jesus. They recognized Jesus' power and had faith that he could do for them what mere humans could not. They knew that a mere touch from him could cure them forever. The centurion didn't even need to see Jesus heal his servant to know that it had been done. These people were healed because of their faith in Jesus Christ. They knew that he had the power to heal, and they weren't afraid to ask for his help. They humbled themselves before the Lord to beg for his aid, and Jesus was happy to help them. When you or a loved one becomes ill, how do you react? Do you panic and allow fear of the future to overwhelm you? Or do you turn to the Lord and ask him for aid? If you don't believe that the Lord can heal you or your loved one, he never will. But if you pray to him and ask for aid, he will hear your prayer. This is no guarantee that he will perform a miracle, but once you have taken your troubles to God, you can be sure that he will do what is best, and you can take comfort in the fact that it is all in his hands. Whenever we are afraid, the best thing to do is to let God take control. He has power over all things. Mark 4 tells the story of when the disciples were in a boat with Jesus when a violent storm arose. The disciples were afraid for their lives, but Jesus was sleeping peacefully below the deck. Huge waves swarmed the ship, and the disciples woke Jesus up, saying, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Jesus remained calm in the midst of their panic. He stood on the upper deck and spoke to the wind and waves, which immediately died down. The water became smooth as glass, and the wind was a gentle breeze. Jesus turned to the disciples and said, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Even though the Son of God was in the boat with them, the disciples feared the storm more than they trusted Jesus to keep them safe. How often do you and I do the same? When our troubles overwhelm us, they are all we can see, and we forget that we have God on our side. God is bigger than our troubles, stronger than anything we will ever face, and more powerful than we can ever imagine. Fear has no place in your life when God is in it. Even when God isn't physically with you like Jesus was with the disciples, He is always with you in spirit. He will always hear your prayer and be willing to take away your fears. One of the biggest trials we face in this life is death. We fear losing loved ones, and we fear facing the ultimate end for ourselves. But God is bigger than even death. In John 11, Jesus received word that his friend Lazarus was sick. By the time he arrived at the home of Lazarus and his sisters, Lazarus had been dead for four days. But while Jesus wept at the despair of others, he knew what they did not. He was already aware that Lazarus was dead, but he also knew that he would not stay that way. On his way there, Jesus told his disciples, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. The disciples thought he meant literal sleep, but he explained to them that Lazarus was dead. When Jesus asked them to remove the stone in front of the tomb, Lazarus' sister Martha was appalled. She explained that there would be a bad odor for her brother had been buried for some time already. But Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone, and Jesus entered the tomb. He prayed to the Lord and loudly told Lazarus to come out. To everyone's amazement, the man who had been dead for four days rose up and walked out of the tomb like nothing had happened. While Jesus' followers had seen him heal the sick, cast out demons and calm storms, they thought that death was a step beyond his reach. But nothing is beyond God's power. He has power over life and death, over sickness and health, and over the wind and the waves. He can do anything. Not only did God raise Lazarus from the dead, but he also raised Jesus from the dead after he had been slain on the cross. And because of that, we receive Jesus as a mediator between us and God. 
which means that we can go to God with all our troubles and be confident that He will hear us. No matter what you face in this life, you don't need to fear anything because God is bigger than it all. He will give you bread and water to sustain you in both this life and the life to come. He will heal you from sickness when it is His will to do so, and He will calm the storms that come your way. If you ever start to doubt God's power, remember the story of Lazarus and the history of Jesus' own resurrection. God has already defeated death, so we can be sure that there is nothing He cannot conquer. Fear is obsolete in the face of God. Take your troubles to Him and let Him handle them for you. If you flip to a random page in the middle of a book, you aren't going to have a clue what's going on. If you start the book from the beginning, by the time you reach the middle, you'll have some idea of where the story is headed, but you still won't have the full picture. It isn't until you have reached the very end of the story that you can fit all the pieces together and see the big picture. It's the same with our lives. While we are living our lives, we can't know exactly where they are headed. We don't know what God has in store for us. But God is the author of our stories, so He knows exactly what is going to happen to us at all times. He sees the bigger picture, and we have to trust in Him to guide us towards it. When we deal with trials and tragedies, we often ask God why He would allow us to go through such pain. Sometimes, we even allow our sorrow to separate us from God. We may become angry or bitter or turn away from God instead of toward Him. But when we do that, we are forgetting that God has a reason for everything and that He works all things together for His good. God knows better than we do, and we have to trust Him. Of course, this isn't always easy. Nobody knows suffering quite like Job, but he presents a wonderful example of trusting in the Lord in the midst of sorrow. When we read the book of Job, we are given more information than Job ever had. The book opens with the meeting between the Lord and Satan. God references Job as a wonderful example of a godly man, but Satan challenges the Lord by saying that Job worships him while he is blessed and protected, but if he were to lose all that he had, he would turn away from God. The Lord responds, Very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. When we read the rest of the book, we have to keep in mind that Job knows nothing of this meeting. He has no idea that the Lord is using him as an example of a godly and upright man. Job is in the middle of his story, and he has no idea how it's going to end. Over the course of time, everything that Job holds dear is taken away from him. He loses all of his livestock, followed by his sons and daughters. When he hears this news, Job says, The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. But little does Job know that his suffering has only just begun. In the second chapter, we read of another meeting between Job and Satan, where God upholds Job as a righteous man. This time, Satan claims that if Job himself is harmed, he would no longer praise the Lord. So, the Lord gives Satan permission to strike Job's flesh on the condition that he doesn't kill him. Job is then inflicted with painful sores from the base of his feet to the crown of his head. But when his wife encourages him to curse God, Job replies, Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Despite all of his pain and suffering, Job still refuses to turn away from the Lord. We are always more than happy to accept blessings from the Lord, yet we have a hard time facing trials. But our lives on earth are full of ups and downs. We cannot live perfect lives because sin entered the world and we have been corrupted by it. We must learn to not only be thankful for the blessings, but to remain loyal to God throughout the trials. Near the end of the book of Job, God speaks to his servant and emphasizes his great power over all things. When Job hears this, he says, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. 
Job recognizes that God is in control of all things, including his life. God knows the purpose of each of his servants, and his will will be done, whether we like it or not. But while this may sound scary, it really isn't. We should be encouraged by the fact that God has control and that He will lead us wherever He wants us to go. And in the end, we will be rewarded for following Him. Job received an earthly reward for enduring his suffering without turning away from God. God restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. You and I are not guaranteed an earthly reward like the one Job received, but we are guaranteed something much better eternal life in heaven with God. This reward has only been made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, which is part of the Lord's big picture for all earthly time. The Lord doesn't just know what is going to happen a few hours from now, a few days from now, or even a few years from now. He knows what is going to happen from the beginning time all the way until the end. And we can see evidence of this knowledge throughout the Bible. The Old Testament is full of hints and prophecies of the Messiah. Jesus did not arrive until many years later, but his death has been foreshadowed since the beginning of time. In Genesis 22, God commands Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac as the ultimate test of his loyalty. This command foreshadowed God's sacrifice of his only son on the cross in the New Testament. But while God spared Isaac's life, he could not do the same with his own son. He sacrificed Jesus on the cross so that we could be made blameless in his sight and receive eternal life in heaven. In Numbers 21, while Moses was leading the Israelites through the wilderness, he began to complain against God. They accused Moses and the Lord of bringing them away from Egypt to die. So the Lord sent venomous snakes among them and anyone who was bitten died. The Israelites turned to Moses and admitted that they had sinned against God. They pleaded with Moses to ask God to save them. God then instructed Moses to make a bronze snake and place it on a pole somewhere in the camp where everyone could see it. He told the people that anyone who was bitten by a snake would be saved if they looked up at the bronze snake. This story is told in only a few verses, Yet it is full of symbolism and foreshadowing. The bronze snake represented Jesus on the cross. In the same way that the Israelites who looked upon the snake would live, those of us who look upon Jesus on the cross will be granted eternal life. As Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Even though the Israelite story takes place many years before Jesus' arrival on earth, the bronze snake shows us that God had a plan all along. He always knew that Jesus would come to earth and die on the cross to save sinners, even before the Israelites reached the Promised Land. And this isn't the only example of foreshadowing of Jesus' coming. David is considered one of the most righteous characters of the Old Testament, and he is often compared to Jesus. In fact, Jesus is referred to as the Son of David. David's life closely mirrors that of Jesus, and he is considered a type of Christ. Like Jesus, David was born to humble beginnings. He was the youngest son of a shepherd, yet he became the king of Israel. Jesus was born in a manger, yet he is the king of kings. David endured many difficulties throughout his life, but he remained faithful to the Lord. He had many of the attributes that Christ is known for, such as patience, mercy, righteousness, and loving kindness. He was even born in Bethlehem, where Mary would give birth to Jesus many years later. But while David represents Christ in the Old Testament, there is one very big difference between the two. Jesus is the perfect Son of God, while David was not. David was righteous, but he sinned. He did not live a perfect and blameless life, but Jesus did. And because of that, Jesus was able to accomplish what no one else ever could. He was able to save us from our sins. Jesus' birth was even predicted in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, where Isaiah writes, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. 
the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. This verse is repeated in the story of Jesus' birth in Matthew 1, which says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. We can clearly see from these verses that the Lord knew all along that Jesus would come to earth to save his people. God had a plan all along, and nothing could thwart it. He gave hints to his people of what was to come, but only God saw the bigger picture of salvation. Only God knew when and how he would deliver his people from their sins. God sees the bigger picture, not only in your life, but for the whole world. He is aware of the entire timeline of the universe from beginning to end. We never have to doubt that God knows what he is doing in our lives because he sees everything. He knows exactly where we fit into his plan, even when we don't. We have to be like Job and trust in the Lord's plan, no matter how painful it may be for us. Whatever you are going through, remember that it is happening for a reason. God has already written your story from beginning to end, and you can trust him to navigate you through it. We need to hold on to the Lord and remember how much he loves us. He loves us so much that he sacrificed his only son on the cross to save us from our sins. Jesus freely offered his life so that we could receive salvation through him. From the moment he was born, Jesus knew that he had been sent to die and he lived a perfect life and willingly went to the cross because that's how much he loves us. We don't need to be afraid of where our lives are headed because God has already written our ending and we can trust him with our lives. When I look at people who were once believers or people who have settled for things that are by far less than what God has in store for them, one thing that comes to mind is that they probably didn't know what God had in store for them. Because if they had known, they probably would have done better. If they had seen only a glimpse of the glory that is to come, I believe they would not have given up on God or themselves. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 says, My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priests, because you have ignored the law of your God. I also will ignore your children. The application of the scripture is dynamic. Sarah, the wife of Father Abraham, didn't know that God was going to bless her household with a child through her womb, and this is why she suggested that her husband should take Hagar. Joseph, on the other hand, knew where God was taking him. He knew that God was leading him to become a leader and he saw it coming. He knew that he didn't stand a chance in his father's house because he was not the firstborn child. God did not tell him that he would become a slave or a prisoner, but his knowledge of God's plan gave him a positive attitude amidst his challenges. Beloved, you need to know that where you are is not your destination. Where you are is a checkpoint or better still, a track on your way to your destiny. God doesn't have mediocre plans for you. That's why he said in his word, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm, plans to give you hope and a future. What you're seeing may be giving you the impression that things can never get any better. You may be feeling like everything is working against you, but you have to just believe that in all of these, God has a better and bigger plan. Sometimes I try to see God as an artist, when an artist begins to paint on a canvas, you'll never be able to guess what he's going to come up with. You may be seeing a landscape drawing from the onset, but at some point, you begin to wonder if he has changed it to a human portrait or something that looks like it. While you may think that the painter changed his mind along the way, this assumption is usually false. Every work an artist does exists twice, first in his mind and then on his canvas. This is how it is with God. God has a clear picture of where he's taking you. He has a clear vision of what he's preparing you for. A lack of understanding of how God works will put you on edge when things do not look favorable. That incident in your life that looks like a brush stroke on the wrong side of the canvas is part of God's plan for your life. Don't worry, he is the master and he is a professional. 
he will blend it in. The delay in your achievements, the delay in your marriage and conception, all of these are not palatable experiences, but they all make up the brushstrokes here and there on the canvas that may or may not make any sense at the moment. Someone else may be asking, how does my losing my job contribute to God's bigger picture? How does the rejection I've suffered for years make up God's supposed good plans? I want you to notice something about these questions. They all began with how. You may never be able to trust God and the process of your becoming if you keep seeking to know how everything will work. Those who trust God often don't know how God has planned to do what He promised, but know that He will do what He says He will do, when He wants to do it and through any means that He deems fit. In most cases, when God calls a man, He does not give the man the full details of what his journey will entail. He allows the man to find out on the way to his destination. When you keep refusing to take any step until you receive every detail of what God has in mind, you'll end up worried, anxious, and possibly unable to move towards your desired future. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. It's no longer faith when you've seen it already. The essence of faith is that God has said that He will do it. And so even though you are yet to receive it, keep trusting and hoping for it. God's not trying to brag or boast when He tells you about what He plans to do for you. He is only conditioning your mind to believe and keep hoping on the words that He's spoken to you. He knows that if you know how big your future is, you will persevere rather than give up in the face of adversity. He knows that if only you knew that there are no products without production processes, you would patiently pass through the process you're already going through. About the unpleasant circumstances and oppositions you encounter, James chapter 1 verse 13 says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does He tempt anyone. Beloved, God does not orchestrate evil events but He aids us to overcome them and emerge victorious. That job you lost may have been the devil's strategy to discourage you and give you a mental breakdown, but God can use that season of joblessness to draw you closer to Himself and prepare you for a bigger and more comfortable job. The rejections may be persistent arrows the enemy shoots at your confidence in God and yourself, but God can use them to save you from people who don't deserve to be in your life and connect you with people who will truly value you and help you to become all that He has in mind for you. There was a time in my life when the pressure was so much, I thought I was getting crushed. The people who loved me advised me to quit. They believed it was stupid to keep trying after so many failures. I was on the verge of giving up when I looked at the book where I wrote all that God had spoken to me about my future. Today, I look back and thank God for the advantage that knowledge gave me. I was able to connect the little dots and see the broken pieces of my life as a puzzle that God was fixing. That was how I found encouragement to stay with God, irrespective of what came my way. When you lose sight of the future God has promised you, you'll settle for an alternative that's nothing compared to what He promises. After Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, Peter went back to his fishing profession. You may want to ask, why did Peter forget about the life of ministry and preaching the gospel as Jesus had commanded them? If I were to answer this, I would say that he lost sight of the bigger picture. He had forgotten the day that they were sent out to heal and deliver people by the Spirit of God. Peter had become so accustomed to the current happenings that he decided to settle for less. If he had remained a fisherman, he probably would not have made the kind of impact he made in the ministry of Jesus. But for God's mercy, Peter would have ended up not fulfilling the divine mandate. This is what a lack of knowledge and understanding can do to a man. If you have no idea that God is working out a kingdom marriage for you, you may up marrying a hoodlum because you feel he's the only one that can accept you for who you are. The scriptures admonish us to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
This explains how Jesus was able to endure the scorn of men and the brutality he underwent. He ignored the insults of men because he knew about the glory that was set before him. Do you know what God has in store for you? I'm not talking about a perfectly laid down plan like the blueprints of professional architects. I'm talking about the words of assurance that God has spoken to you concerning where He is leading you to. Not knowing how to hear from God is not an excuse if you're a believer. The written Word of God is a perfect summary of all of God's plans for your life. God's Word is a source of faith and hope. It's a source of motivation and strength. It gives you hints on what God is up to even in the worst of situations. It unveils your face to be able to see farther into the future and not be limited by the circumstances of the present day. The day you drop the Word of God is the day you'll begin to lose sight of the big picture you need to stay focused on. An unpopular quote says, you cannot be featured in the future you cannot picture. God's Word gives you the ability to see the picture of the artwork God's working on so you can stay glued throughout the entire process. Romans chapter 8, verse 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. There might be suffering today, and there might even be a lot of discomfort tomorrow, but there is a future glory. Your present circumstances might be trying to stop you, but you need to keep your eyes fixed on the glory that is to come. However, you cannot believe in what you know nothing about. I admonish you, brethren, make the Word of God your companion. As simple as acquiring knowledge may seem, it solves a lot of the problems you have. It saves you from giving up and losing out on everything. It saves you from settling for peanuts or crumbs. If you choose to remain ignorant of the kind of package that God has for you, you will accept every other package that is delivered to you, even when it is presented by the enemy. When you take a taxi or an Uber, you want the driver to be fully alert and capable. You are trusting them with your life and hoping that they will keep you safe. So, you would never get in the car of someone who is clearly incapable of driving well. If the driver told you that you were his first customer and that this was the first time he'd driven a car, you wouldn't feel very safe. You wouldn't want to trust him with your life. And yet, we tend to trust ourselves with our lives. We take full control of our decisions and think that we have the competence to do so. But when you trust yourself to lead your life, you are not choosing the safe or smart option. Instead, we should be trusting God with our lives because there is no one more trustworthy and capable than Him. Let go of your life and let God take control. Letting go implies a loss of something, but it can also be a gain. When you let go of your life and give it to God, you are letting go of the burden that the illusion of leadership places on you and the fear that comes with it. The reality is that we are not in control of our own lives, but because we think we are, we place all kinds of pressure on ourselves, which can cause fear and anxiety. We can never be sure that we have made the right decision. This is because our control is nothing but an illusion. We only think that we have control of our own lives, but God actually has all the control. Proverbs 16.9 tells us, In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. We see this firsthand when we make plans and something beyond our control changes them. Let's say you have plans to move to New York to work in a big office building, but your mother gets sick and you remain in your hometown to take care of her. You would naturally be disappointed that your plans changed, and you would probably question why God would allow your mother to get sick. You might even think that your life is ruined. You may become bitter and angry, constantly wishing that your life had turned out the way you wanted it to. You might begin to think of yourself as a failure for being unable to fulfill your plans, even though it could not be helped. When you react to your situation this way, your life will be miserable. You will live under a burden that you have placed upon yourself. So what should you do instead? 
recognize that God is in control. As you made plans to go to New York, God knew that you would not go there. He knew that you would remain at home because that's where he wanted you to be. Instead of being angry that your plans didn't work out, consider why God led you elsewhere. Look upon your situation as an opportunity to serve God. You may think that you are in the driver's seat of your own life, but the reality is that you are a passenger holding on to a plastic steering wheel. God is the one driving. The sooner you let go of that plastic wheel, the sooner you can look around you and appreciate where you are. You don't have to fear taking a wrong turn because as long as you follow God's direction, you will be on the right path. Let go of your fear and relax because God will keep you safe. You may be wondering how you can know that God will keep you safe. You may wonder why you should trust Him. Well, my friends, God is not like you and me. He is unlike any human being on this earth. He has more power and abilities than we could ever imagine. For example, God is outside of time. While you and I are limited to being in a particular space at a certain time, God has no such limitations. We can live in the present and observe the past, but we will never know the future before it happens. But God knows everyone's future. Psalm 139.4 says, Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. God knows all of our thoughts and deeds way before we do. God is the beginning and the end. He existed before time because He created it. It's hard for us to imagine anything existing outside of time, but there are many aspects of God that are beyond our human understanding. But just because we can't fully comprehend them, that doesn't mean they aren't true. God also exists outside of space. He is everywhere at once. He is always aware of your thoughts and actions, both before and after them. God is also all-powerful. He created the earth and everything on it, including human beings. Throughout the Bible, God demonstrates His power again and again. A great illustration of His power is shown in Exodus, when the Lord sends plagues into Egypt to convince the Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. For the first plague, God transformed all the bodies of water in Egypt into blood. The fish died, the area stank, and the Egyptians had no clean water to drink. Then God sent an abundance of frogs into Egypt and then killed them a few days later. When the Pharaoh still refused to let the Israelites go, the Lord sent gnats and then flies to cover every surface of the country and its people. While the Pharaoh's magicians tried to produce the same effect, they couldn't. Their power was no match for God's. But since the Pharaoh would still not release the Israelites, God sent more peril upon the Egyptians. He killed their livestock and made them sick with boils. He sent a hailstorm to destroy the crops and locusts to eat whatever had survived the storm. Then he sent darkness to cover Egypt. And when Pharaoh's heart was still hard against him, the Lord sent an angel to kill all the firstborn children of the Egyptians. Only after God performed all these amazing feats did the Pharaoh finally relent and allow the Israelites to leave their lives of bondage. This story not only shows God's amazing power, but also reveals His love for His people. He kept the Israelites safe throughout every plague, and He did not give up on trying to free them. Pharaoh's heart was hardened by God so that the people would see His amazing power firsthand and be willing to trust Him to lead them to the Promised Land. But God's most amazing demonstration of power and love is seen in the New Testament. God sent His only Son to earth to die so that we might be saved. Jesus lived a perfect life and sacrificed Himself on the cross because that's how much He loves us. And three days after He died, Jesus rose from the dead to demonstrate God's power over death. God controls everything on earth, like nature and the lives of humans. But He also controls that which is beyond the physical realm such as death. 
Nobody can ever love us as much as God does. And because he loves us, he wants to protect us and keep us safe. God's omniscience, all powerfulness, and sacrificial love show us that we can certainly trust him to be in control of our lives. Now we come to the question of how to let God take control. It sounds easy to sit back and let God drive, but it can be harder than you might think. We have a natural desire to be in control of our lives, so we often switch back into the driver's seat, sometimes without realizing it. When we let God take control, we must submit to Him. James 4, 7-8 says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. When we submit to God, it becomes easier to follow Him and resist Satan. When you give your life to God, you want to follow Him no matter where He may lead you, and you will recognize when Satan is trying to lead you elsewhere. God will give you the power to resist temptation and follow Him instead. If you want to let God take control, you need to be willing to follow Him. There will be times when God is calling you to do something you don't want to do, like when He called Jonah to Nineveh. But you have to trust in the Lord and the fact that He knows what is best for you. He has placed you where you are for a reason. He always knows what He is doing. Some of the more practical ways of letting God take control include praying and reading Scripture. The more you pray to God, the more your relationship with Him will grow and the easier it will be to trust Him. God is both your father and your friend, so you can talk to Him about anything and He will listen. When you wake up in the morning, pray that the Lord would give you patience throughout the day to give control over to Him. When you are struggling, turn to God and give your burden to Him. Whenever life feels like it's getting out of control, that is usually a sign that you haven't given control to God. If this is the case, don't hesitate to pray whenever and wherever you are. It's also very important to familiarize yourself with the scriptures so you can gain a better understanding of who God is. If life begins to feel overwhelming and you begin to doubt that God can handle it, turn to the Bible and read about all the amazing things He has done. The one who has conquered death can surely take control of your life. Soak up the verses that tell us of God's love. There are plenty to be found. It is much easier to give control to someone who knows you and loves you than to a stranger. It is natural to plan for your life, and there is nothing wrong with that. But when plans don't go your way, don't give up or get angry. Instead, remember that God is the one who is in control of your life and consider why He has led you where you are. Trust in God's direction, and don't be afraid to follow Him. Let go of the illusion that you are driving, and be free of the burdens the illusion places on you. Live your life freely and happily, knowing that God is in control, and that everything always works according to His plan. God's plans are not always the same as our plans, but they are always better. Every believer knows how important prayer is. We know that prayer is one of the pillars of our faith and that prayer is how we commune with our Father in heaven. It is how we communicate with Him and make our requests known. There are so many benefits of leading a prayerful life. Many of us desire to go deeper in prayer. We want to be more spiritual and the way to achieve that is by being more prayerful. There are some of us whose goal in our journey with Christ this year is to pray more and have made this our divine assignment or task. If you've chosen to dive deeper into prayer this year, you're making one of the most impactful decisions of your life and I am cheering for you. However, I am going to be honest with you on something. It won't be easy. There's an invisible enemy that would like nothing more than to stand in your way. He knows there is so much to be gained from being a prayerful person, and he is not going to let that happen. On some days, he will make you feel like you are not in the mood to pray. On others, he will demoralize you to stop praying because the prayers are not being answered fast enough. That is why today I want us to be encouraged by studying the benefits of praying consistently so that you can keep forging ahead with courage even when you don't feel like it. 
When you start praying constantly, you grow closer to God. Prayer is direct communication with God. It establishes, builds, and nurtures a relationship with Him. You will be filled with His Spirit who would reveal spiritual things to you and guide you to lead a godly life. He will become your helper, comforter, teacher, and friend. Eventually, you will start to move with confidence because you do not just have an idea, but you actually know who God is. When you begin to pray consistently, God becomes a part of your life. He's not just an idea at the back of your mind, but an actual being, your Father, who you involve even in the most trivial matters of your life. The voice of the Holy Spirit becomes clearer in your life. You begin to hear Him with confidence. You become familiar with the way He speaks, the way He operates, what He likes and dislikes. And this way, you find yourself closer to God more than ever. This also helps you become more obedient to Him and live out His will for you. Praying consistently enables you to hear more from God and be better able to align your actions with what you hear. For instance, when you are praying over a particular situation like a job or moving and receive direction from Him, you will have a heart that is willing to obey. When you pray consistently, your faith grows. When we hear about praying constantly, our minds are likely to think about unanswered prayers, and that is right, because it is in the face of challenges that it is the hardest to pray. No one has a problem with praying and thanking God when things are great. However, when things become tough and God seems unresponsive, this is when it is hardest to pray. That is also when we begin to doubt His presence and love for us and feel like we have been alienated from Him. At this same time, the devil comes at us with all manner of lies. However, if we keep our faith and continue to pray, not only will we become closer to God and obey His word, but also our faith will grow. Faith is like a muscle. The more we use it, the stronger it becomes. As believers, we should teach ourselves to trust harder, especially when we cannot see even a single reason to. We are supposed to pray harder the times we feel like giving up. It is by doing so that our faith in the Lord will grow. It is not when we are having it all easy, but when everything seems like it's falling apart. Staying in prayer when everything is seemingly going wrong in your life will grow your faith to heighten levels you never imagined. Also, praying without ceasing builds the character of Christ in us. You see, believers are the children of God. We belong to the heavenly royal family. We represent Christ here on earth, and we have been called to be more like Him day by day, moment by moment. We are supposed to be the salt and the light of the world, reflecting the light of Him who reconciled us with our Father, and that is Jesus Christ. Although we are not the source of that light, we are supposed to reflect it and shine it upon the whole world. Through prayer, this becomes possible and easy. We cannot be more Christ-like if we are not engaging Him in prayer. We cannot shine the light of Christ to the world if that light has not filled us first. We cannot follow in His footsteps if we are not yielding to His leadership. Prayer is how we ask Him to help us. It is how we put ourselves at the feet of Jesus and let Him guide us as we show the world the way to Him. When we pray, we ask for the Holy Spirit to fill us, to guide us, to enable us to be more like Christ, so that the whole world can see Him through us. Consistent prayer in your life bears a lot of fruits. While teaching His disciples how to pray, Jesus told them in Matthew 6, 5-6, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Go into your room and close the door behind you. This means getting rid of distractions, doing away with the things that might pull us away from the presence of God, moving away from noise, and making sure that you are praying with the right motives. Prayer is not for getting the attention or praise of man, but to glorify the name of God. This is a habit that every serious prayerful man or woman must have. Making time to be in the presence of God all by yourself, without the presence of any person or electronic gadget. 
For prayer to be effective, we must be calm in the spirit and physically too. Every believer must make this a consistent habit of their lives if they desire to get to intimate levels with God. When we do this, Jesus told his disciples that God, who sees what is done in private, will reward us. Prayer doesn't have to be loud for it to be effective. Not everyone must see that you are praying and crying. It is not about how loudly or long you do it for, but all about the sincerity of your heart. What are your reasons for praying? Why do you wake up and go to morning glory? Why do you fast and spend your lunch hours in a secret place with the Lord? This is what Jesus is referring to when he says the God who sees what is done in private will reward you. God sees your motives. He knows your intentions. He knows why. Even though it may be hidden from men, he does and he will reward each person based on that hidden motive. In the parable of the widow and the unjust judge, while teaching about the importance of being consistent in prayer, the judge did not grant the woman her requests because he wanted to. He did not do it because he thought she deserved justice either. He gave her the justice she deserved so that she could stop being a nuisance to him. I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. Luke 18, four through five. Jesus is driving this point here. If this judge, as unjust, uncompassionate, and as unqualified for the job as he was, could grant the woman her request because of her persistence, how much more will loving and holy father give what is right to his children? When praying, we must know that results do not always show immediately. Our timelines are not the same as the Lord's. Persistent prayer requires tenacity and resilience. Daily, we will face many hurdles that may put a damper on our prayer drive. Life involves disappointment, loss, injustice, and persecution, all very good reasons to give up and lose hope. However, a life attuned to God's presence, justice, and goodness, all covered by consistent, genuine prayer, is a life that can endure. This widow's persistence illustrates our need to pray without ceasing. Prayer changes us more than it changes the people around us. It deepens our faith and trust in God and empowers us to wait with hope for God to act. It's the reason why Jesus ended the parable to his disciples with the question of whether or not the Son of Man will find anyone faithful when he comes. Which is to say, as Eugene Peterson put it, will he find men and women who are still praying who have not given up, who have not lost heart. The gospel of this passage challenges us not to just pray, but to trust in God, even when the answers that we seek do not come immediately. Will we have enough faith to endure until change happens? The Bible has so many examples of people that reaped great rewards from consistent prayer, from women like Hannah getting a son despite being called barren, the widow we have just studied about getting justice from the uncompassionate judge, to Paul and Silas being released from prison. With prayer, you will never go wrong because it opens so many doors. It is the door to infinite breakthroughs, opportunities, and blessings. The breakthrough you have been seeking, that specific thing that is constantly on your mind, could be just a prayer away. Do not give up on prayer. Great things happen when you pray without ceasing. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 17. Ephesians 3:20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. What is your anticipation about God? How far does your imagination stretch anytime you think about what you can or cannot do? How far do you go in claiming the promises of God in your life? Are you limitless? Or do you end up in the doubts of, can God really do this for me? Ephesians tells us that God can do more exceedingly more 
than we can ever ask for. If I gave you an opportunity to ask for things from God, what would you ask for? A big mansion? A car? Many kids? A new job? Just think about what you'd love the Lord to bless you with. The Bible says that God can do exceedingly abundantly more than that. You could ask for a small house and God gives you a mansion. You could ask for one car. He gives you as many as you need to hire out. You could ask for one child. He gives you triplets, more than you can ask for, more than you could ever imagine, more than you can even think of. That is what the Lord can do. He is not limited. Nothing can stop him from doing the things he wants to do. He is unstoppable. Life may sometimes put us in situations where we doubt the power of God. You may find yourself in a situation where you can't really see him doing anything. You can end up right in the middle of that situation you always dreaded. For me, it is usually starting over, building something, and then one day it just gets lost. It can be devastating. Mine happened last year. I lost every single thing I had. I lost friends. My family could never stop blaming me for whatever had led me into that situation. As someone who has always been afraid of starting afresh, I was hopeless. I'd look back and wonder why it had to happen to me. I'd remember all the effort I had made, all the sacrifices, all the money, and the late night hours, and then my heart would just sink. It was a tough moment. I'd look ahead and imagine the future, and I want to tell you this, and it might appear unbelievable, but I never thought I'd rise again. Every time I'd start to imagine myself in the future, I'd just see darkness, bleakly empty, despair and hopelessness. I never thought that I would one day bounce back from that major setback in my life, but here I am today. I look back at my last year and I see God. I look back at where I was then and where I am today and I testify of a living God who restores, a God who will never ever forsake or leave his children, a God who will never let those who trust him to be put to shame. He is Jehovah God, our God. What can't he do? That is what he asks us in Jeremiah 32, 27. What can't he do? I am in a way better position than I was before. I am stable in all aspects of my life that I thought would never recover. I have found healing in the Lord Jesus. He has restored me and given back unto me the joy of salvation. And as long as I live, I will thank him. I will glorify him. I will praise him. My little testimony is just geared towards telling you one thing that God's plans for you are bigger and better, more wonderful and amazing than your own. They are beautiful. He assures us in Jeremiah 29 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. The plans God has for you are plans to give you a hope and a future, plans to build you not to destroy you, plans to give back to you, not to take away from you, plans to restore you, not to push you further down the pit that you are in. God has the whole of your life on the palm of his hand. He looks and he sees everything. Nothing in your life has been hidden from him and everything that happens, if you love him, happens according to his divine will and purpose for your life for your good. Each and every single situation, moment, and encounter in your life all fit perfectly into the plan that God has for your life. They are all part and parcel of the good and perfect will He has for you. You are not to fear anything. You are not on your own. It's not for you to control the ending. All you have to do is trust the one who's directing it. In Isaiah 55, 8, God says that his ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Our imaginations are not 
his imaginations. His are way much bigger and greater than ours. We are limited by our shortcomings and our pasts. We don't want to dream big or pray big because the enemy tells us that it is not possible. We are afraid of saying out loud the things we want because who knows? They may sound silly to others. We keep our desires to ourselves and pray to God about them with double-mindedness because they sound insane. But you know what? God is not limited in any way. He has never been and he will never be. The Bible says that there is nothing that is impossible for him. There is not a single thing on earth that he cannot do. When life hits us hard, when it sucks all the joy out of our veins, when living becomes one long, never-ending nightmare, we lose hope. We resign to fate. We give up any hope of living better lives because it sounds impossible. We feel like we have been stuck in this pit and we're going to die there. Nothing good will ever come out of our lives or families or our education. Like this is our end. And that is it. We better get used to it. However, that is not true. The plan that God has for you is greater than what you could ever imagine. Regardless of what situation you are going through now, regardless of who said you're never going to make it, regardless of how bad your family hates you and how they have rejected you, regardless of how fast that terminal illness is spreading in your body, I just want you to hear this. The plans God has for you are way, way much bigger than you can ever anticipate. They are unfathomable by human understanding. They cannot be understood in our human capacity. God works in mysterious ways that we can never understand. And he has a plan for everyone, for you and me. Maybe pain has blocked that window of hope from your life. Maybe you don't think that you can ever get back on your feet again. Maybe you feel that the pain and hurt and sorrow you feel for the loss of a dear one will never heal. Or maybe you feel that your family will never be whole again, or that your business will never recover to the same level that it was before it went crumbling down. These are just your thoughts. It is just the way you perceive things from that painful spot you stand on. But God has different thoughts from the ones you have. As far as he is concerned, your journey has just started. Where he is taking you is even farther from where you have come from. This is just the beginning of your uplifting. The Lord is not done with you yet. In fact, Philippians 1 6 says, And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Satan may have tried to lie to you that this is the end of you, that from this point onwards nothing will change. But those are just that, lies. Guard your heart and mind and do not allow Satan to have a foothold in your life through lies and discouragement and fear. Go forward in the confidence that God isn't finished with your situation yet. The best is yet to come. That is the promise of God, that if he began it in you, then he will be faithful enough to finish it. The Lord's promises in your life are true. He is faithful and nothing is too hard for him to do for you. If you had started to lose hope, take heart. Begin to believe that better things await you on the other side of your pain. Believe that you may have trouble today, but tomorrow will bring with it happiness. The psalmist said that weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Rejoice in the fact that even if this may seem to be it, it is not. Be happy because God has bigger plans for you. He is preparing a table for you. He is making ready the moment of your glorification. He is strengthening you and solidifying your testimony. What hurts you today will be what you stand on tomorrow because God will turn it around. He will change the story of your life, the story of your family, the story of your children, the story of your little home. He will make a change of things, all in alignment to the big plan he has in store for you. No matter how bad things might be right now, have hope, keep up the faith. Remain steadfast in prayer and hopeful in God that soon he will reveal to you what he has been making out of your life. Soon the transformation will happen. 
Soon, the ones that saw you jobless, asking for loans to pay rent, will see you build your own house. Those same people that saw your childless years, filled with sorrow and grief, wondering what mistake you did, will hear the cry of a little one in your home, your own baby. Those who witnessed your accident and saw you on that hospital bed and in unsaid words thought you were never going to recover, will see you walk without any aid. What I am saying is, the plans God has for you are bigger than your current situation. His plans outdo your wildest imaginations. They are greater than any other thing or person in your life. So, no matter who or what might be trying to convince you otherwise, do not give in. God has the ultimate say over your life, and His plans take dominance over your plans and thoughts. Just hang in there. His breakthrough is coming soon.